Jesus' power is what? Infinite. Infinite. And His abilities are? Infinite. Right. Then, if you can read it, it says, um, He is also known as the Son of God, right? Or the Son of Man, Chosen One, Prince of Peace, First born amongst many, light of the world, Lamb of God, and the heir of the promise. Right? That's what it says there. Now, if you drop down to you on the other side, you'll see that your power level and your abilities are the same as Jesus. Are they the same? Yes. So you have infinite power and infinite abilities. And you'll see there the description is Son of God, Son of Man, Chosen One, Peacemaker, Born of God, brother of Jesus, light of the world, living sacrifice, and heirs of the promise. That is who you are. So there are some things Jesus was able to do. He was able to control the weather. He was able to know what was coming, foreknowledge, right? He was able to transform mat matter. He turned water into wine, okay? He was able to manipulate matter. He walked on the seas. He was, old, he was able to multiply matter. He fed the 4,000 or the 5,000, depending on which story you're reading. And um, he regenerated matter because he healed people. He had authority over spirits. He cast demons out. He was able to fly because he went up into heaven. Mm -hmm. Right? And he was able to teleport because he took the boat that was in the middle of the sea after he walked on water, the Bible says, and he went to the other side, like this. They were on the other side. Okay, so these abilities are yours. But if you look at your list, you'll say, it'll say they're not yet used. Yeah? Does it say that there? Yet to be used. Right? So you have access to the very same things Jesus had access to, you haven't just you haven't yet realized what you have access to, so you haven't renewed your mind to fully believe the fullness of God that is in you. Because Jesus operated according to the fullness of God that was in him. Does that make sense? So I want to I want you to see this blueprint here because Jesus, when he was born, he was uh, his the impregnation of Mary happened by the Spirit impregnating Mary. As the Spirit hovered over Mary, she fell pregnant. Yeah? yeah? Okay? And so Jesus was born of the Spirit. Am I right? Would you agree with that? Yeah. When you are born again, are you born of the Spirit? Yes. So when you get born again, you get born the same way Jesus was born. Born of the Spirit. Yay. <laughs> Amen. Um, and then in all of the canon, we don't see Jesus doing any miracles until he's baptized in water and filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, there are other extramarial books that claim Jesus did miracles, but those are not part of what the canon prescribes as actual the biblical record. So we know that Jesus didn't do any miracles until after he came out of the desert. So he goes to John, John baptizes him, the Holy Spirit descends upon him like a dove, the Father says, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus is then led by the Spirit into the desert where he is tempted for 40 days. And when he comes out of the desert, the Bible says, and he came out of the desert, right, full of the Holy Spirit and with power. So what happened in the desert that Jesus went in full with the Holy Spirit, but he came out full of the Holy Spirit and with power. Something happened there. Am I right? And what happened in the desert was that Jesus exercised the authority of the Word over the flesh to empower the Spirit over the flesh. So remember I told you about that diagram yesterday about how we normally see it, body, soul, spirit, and that in the garden it was actually spirit, body, I mean, sorry, spirit, soul, and then body. 
And that's also why Adam and Eve were really not aware of their physical body because they were living out of their spirit. They weren't living out of their body. When they disconnected from the spirit, they were left with the body, and so they became aware of their nakedness. Does it make sense? Okay. So what Jesus has done now is he's restored you back to a place where the spirit can be in charge. This is good news. Because in all of Paul's writings, he says, if you walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So have you ever wondered, what does it mean to walk by the Spirit? Well, the things, to be mindful of the things of the Spirit. To be mindful of who you are in the Spirit. To be mindful of your identity by the Spirit. Does it make sense? That will keep you from gratifying the desires of the flesh. So the flesh wants what it wants, you know? The flesh wants to be pampered and looked after and comforted. And it's always about me and what I want and how I want it and what I like and what I don't like. And me, 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 me. Reminds me of those birds that are in Finding Nemo. Mine, 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 mine. So it's... And here's the thing. The only difference between sin... And son is I. Sure. So when I is in the way, there is no son. There is sin. That's why Jesus came and he said, if you're going to follow me, you have to deny yourself. He didn't say deny the devil. He didn't say deny anything else. He said deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me. Now, what does it mean to pick up your cross in our day and age? It means to continue in service to God in spite of the persecution we face. Which is what Jesus did. He modeled that, did he not? He carried his cross in spite of the persecution he was facing. He was perfect in every way, yet they spat at him, they tore out his beard, they put a thorn of crowns on his head, they lashed him and made him bleed, they turned him into literally a heap of flesh bleeding, and they nailed him to a tree, and yet he remained faithful in service to God and to us. That is the example he left us. If you go in your Bibles quickly to 1 Peter chapter 2, Remember, everything I'm sharing with you is to build the strength in you that you need to be able to overcome the enemy's attack against your mind. It's the Word of God that gives us the strength to resist and the strength to stand firm. Amen? So in 1 Peter 2, um, um, in verse 15, it says, For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, and fear God. Honor the emperor, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, you endure sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin, you are beaten for it, you endure, but if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called... You want to know your calling? For this you've been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. And when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten. But he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Yo, that's in the Bible? Yeah. Mark, I've never read that before. 
Amen. So this is an important thing that you understand because you need to have iron, Holy Ghost iron in your bones. So you can stand against the plans and the vials of the enemy and you can break the back of the reality of error and usher in the reality of truth so that heaven can invade the earth. This is why you are here. You are an ambassador of heaven and you are here to bring heaven to earth. But it first has to invade this earth before it can invade the earth around you. Amen? So this thing was made from the earth. And unless this earth is dominated by the Spirit, the environment around you can't be dominated by the Spirit. Does it make sense? All right. So you can see clearly that you have the same ability, the same potential that Jesus had. So that means that if we had to say, okay, what is the aim? In other words, what does maturity look like? It looks like Jesus. And you are all heading towards that as the end product, to be like Jesus in every way, in the way you treat people, in the way you administer power, in the way you, way you serve um, other people, and in the way you rule and reign on the earth. Jesus is the blueprint. He is the example. So when you get saved, baptized in water, and filled with the Holy Spirit, you're literally given everything you need, but you don't yet know all that you have. So um, how many of you, the first time you got a cell phone, you knew how to do everything on it? <laughs> no, it took a while, eh? You had to figure out. And then you realize there's a whole like library of apps out there that can do a whole lot of other things that your phone doesn't do by default. But they're still there, right? So then those apps, they don't do anything. They don't make your phone do something it couldn't do before. Those apps are just programmed to use what your phone has in a way that it can do something new. So it's actually just knowledge that's executing on the same platform. Are you with me? So when you receive revelation on who you are in Christ and what you have access to, you're downloading apps. Are you does that make sense to you? You're downloading those apps and now you can run them. But you know, even when you download a new app, you don't know how to use it until you use it for a bit. Yeah? So just because you've downloaded the app doesn't mean that you know how to use it effectively. You have to keep using it and then you will find how useful it can be. Does that make sense? So we need to realize that even Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered. That Jesus grew in stature with God and man. So if Jesus had to, then guess what? You're going to also have to. Am I right? So Jesus... He didn't come, he wasn't born with the whole Bible downloaded into his head. He actually had to study the scriptures. But he had a friend called the Holy Ghost, which you have also. And he will teach you. But now when you have the right, you see, when you come in, can you feel truth? Can you sense the truth? Like when I'm speaking, there are things that sound true. That's because there's resonance inside of you. The Holy Spirit is resonating. You can feel the frequency of truth. And he's going, yes, yes. And even these things are things that you often have heard before, but now they're coming in alignment. It's like there's an agreement. That's, it's coming in agreement. And you know what I found when my mind was being renewed? That I began to see things a lot more simply than I saw them before. Things were not as complicated. That doesn't mean they were easy. It just meant that they were, they were simple. It's simple to love your neighbor. It's not easy to do it. Yeah? The instruction, do not murder, is a simple instruction. But for some people, it's not easy to not kill that person who keeps annoying you. Am I right? Now, as Christians, we don't have that problem. I know that, right? But the Bible says if you hate your brother in your heart, you've already killed him. So yeah, you know what hate is? Hate isn't when you seek vengeance against someone. Hate is when you're completely disinterested about that person. You couldn't care what happens to them. That's what hate is in the Bible. So when you've cut someone off and you couldn't care what happens to them, you're already hating them. The Bible says you've already committed murder. 
Do you see the standard is a lot higher than what the Pharisees thought it was? Which is why Jesus told them that if you don't repent, you will die in your sins. Because you need Jesus. The biggest problem with the Pharisees was that they believed that they were already fine. They were, they were keeping the law. They were good. It was the other people that had the problem. So Jesus even used that against them when he said, well, you know, the reason I sit with tax collectors and prostitutes is because the sick need the doctor, not the healthy. Am I right? Okay, so these are important things to know. Right, so now yesterday I spoke to you about the fact that you can know God's ways and you can know God's thoughts. Am I right? And I shared with you Isaiah 55 and I explained to you how that particular verse uh, that is normally used to say you can't is actually not in the correct context. If you read the context, you'll see it's not speaking to people who are born again. It's speaking to people who are unrighteous and people who have evil thoughts. Now, God is not unrighteous and his thoughts are not evil, so his thoughts are higher and his ways are higher. And since you have been made the righteousness of God in Christ, your thoughts are righteous and your ways are holy. Does it make sense? That's, they should be. In other words, if you submit to the Holy Spirit, you will manifest holiness because the Holy Spirit manifests holiness. Amen. And then I showed you in 1 Corinthians how you have been given the mind of Christ. Now the problem is you can have something and not use it. For example, my wife has made me a cup of coffee and I haven't had any of it yet. Right? What does it mean? That means I have it, but I have not yet used it. So you can have the righteousness of God, but you can also choose not to use it. So you can have, the Bible says, now that as you have received him, now put him on. Because when you put him on, then you're living him out. But you've received him, and you can also choose to not put him on. So like, for example, most people, let's say you're a born-again believer, but you go to the bar to drink. Right? People will say, oh, you're being a hypocrite because you're going to church on a Sunday when you've been at the bar on the Friday. Am I right? Yeah. But actually you're a hypocrite for being in the bar on a Friday. Yeah. You're not a hypocrite for being in church on Sunday. You should be in church on Sunday. You're a hypocrite for being in the bar because you're acting like something you're not. You're a new creation. That's not who you are anymore. Does that make sense? So the, the truth is actually often the other way around. Judgment will always try and disqualify people from the right thing they're doing because they did something wrong. Whereas conviction will always encourage them to do the right thing in spite of the wrong things they've done. Is this making sense? Okay. So we can see very clearly in 1 Corinthians that you've been given the mind of Christ. But now... How do you adopt this mind of Christ? How do you put this mind on? Because we know in the New Testament that our, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, darkness, and rulers of, of this world. But that battle starts in the minefield or the war zone of your mind. Yeah? So the giants are normally in your mind. They're not actual giants. They're strongholds that need to be brought down. That's why it says in the New Testament that our weapons are not carnal, but they're mighty to the tearing down of strongholds, to bringing every thought and vain imagination into captivity and bringing it into obedience to Christ, being ready to punish any disobedience. Does that make sense? So how do we take those thoughts captive? Well, we have to be able to filter or identify these thoughts. We have to be able to pick up whether the thoughts that we are having are godly or not. Because what you don't realize is that the enemy can't read your thoughts, but he can definitely plant some thoughts in your mind. And how you act will determine whether what he has planted there is working or not. Is this making sense? Okay, so if your mind is renewed... When the thought comes, you have an automatic system that kicks in and goes, no, this is not from God. Yeah? And I don't know if you've realized this, but the devil will always talk in the first person. <laughs> it will always sound like you're thinking. 
Say you're at church and someone doesn't greet you. You'll hear this thought. Ah, that person doesn't like me. They must be talking bad things about me. And then you will go and you'll go, yeah, you're probably right. How come you're agreeing with yourself? Maybe because that thought didn't come from you. Maybe that thought came from somewhere else. Maybe the enemy was speaking to you. Speaking like it's you speaking. So you would buy the idea. And then you start treating that person differently and they didn't do anything wrong. They just may be very busy. And that happens. People in ministry, we understand this all the more. When there's a thousand people you've got to say hello to, it's very difficult. And everyone feels like if they're not going to get hello, then they, they are not loved. And it's not true. If we could get to everyone, we would. So for the sake of it, hello everyone, I love you. You can tell that devil to run away now. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is very important because that's how the enemy starts strife. That's how he starts. Because when, when you become offended because of something like that, then a root of bitterness takes root in your heart. And then you start to treat that person differently. And you actually create more of a problem by doing that. I mean, you could literally, sometimes I'm so busy talking to people, someone can come up to me and speak to me and I don't even hear them. Is it because I don't want to speak to them? No. It's because I'm busy focusing here and I don't even hear them speaking. Guys, please, let me ask you this question. Have you ever, have you ever been busy with something and your wife comes and speaks to you? And then she says, and you hear her say, okay, I'm happy we've agreed on that. And then you go, huh? What, what just happened? Ladies, please understand this. Unless you have a man's full undivided attention. He didn't hear you. It didn't happen. You never said anything. So if you want to speak to him, you say, babe, look at me. Look at me. Okay, have I got your attention? All right, let me speak to you now. And don't speak while you're doing the washing. You know, some, some ladies, they will be doing the washing or cleaning, and they'll walk to the other side of the house, and they'll be sharing vital information. <laughs> and by the time you got halfway through the passage, the man is thinking, I don't understand how she thinks I'm a zero all the way down there. <laughs> so it's the same thing. You understand? We've got to start to have mercy and grace for one another, if we want mercy and grace also. Don't let the devil come in and create division where there isn't any need for division. Love one another. Be kind to one another. Be quick to forgive one another even as Christ has forgiven you. Amen? Okay, so that's very, very important. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 tells us this. It says, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Remember the Bible says God seeks those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. Well, if you want to worship God in spirit and truth, live a life of sacrifice where you are constantly out there in spite of the persecution doing the will of God. That's your reasonable service. That is the minimum you can do. Okay? Verse 2 which is connected to verse 1. It says, do not be conformed to this world. In other words, don't pattern your life according to the system of this world that is corrupt and deformed. Yeah. Then it says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, you are going to change, you're going to metamorphosis, you're going to change from one thing to something else by allowing the new pattern and system of the spirit that is in you to become an expression outside of you as you walk it out in your life. Does it make sense? So instead of manifesting the pattern of the world, you're going to allow the pattern of heaven to manifest in your life. Yeah? And that's why we can't be doing the same things the world is doing and expecting the world to come to us for answers. You don't have any answers when you're doing the same things they're doing. You have answers when your life is different and people can see that 
No matter, I mean, if there's a storm, a flood, you're not freaking out. You're helping the neighbors clean their places. Are you with me? I mean, it was so funny. Um, when I was still working in the office, there was a bunch of ladies there and they were saying there was going to be a flood or anything. And they were all Christians. They go to AFM churches and whatever. And these chicks were freaking out like it's going to be the end of the world. They're going to drown. And I, and I literally said, hey, hey, are you guys Christians? Yes, but this is horrible. This is so weird. I said, hold on. Is God with you? Yes. <laughs> so I'm like, if God is with you, how can you be afraid? You should be there encouraging other people not to be afraid. Why? Because God is with you. I had to correct them in the office. I had to tell them, hey, stop this. Fear is not your portion. God has not given you a spirit of fear. But Mark, these dangers are real. Oh, so it was also real in the boat when the experts told Jesus they were all going to die. These were fishermen. They knew what the sea looked like. They knew what sea was dangerous and what sea wasn't. They were the experts in the field. They were the ones saying, this is disaster is coming. It is the end of the world for us right now. And yet Jesus said, no, Selah. And everything changed. And you have the same authority. You have the same power. You know, when we read the Gospels, often we will identify with one of three groups of, or four groups of people. We'll either identify with the Pharisees or with the disciples or with the sick person, right? Or with the person bringing the sick person, right? We'll identify with these. But none of those people are, are your example. Jesus is your example. So you can only identify with Jesus. So the way Jesus acted in the Gospels, that is the pattern that you're supposed to mimic in your life because you have the spirit of Christ you don't have the spirit of the Pharisees. You don't have the spirit of the disciples. They weren't even born again yet. Amen? Amen. Okay. So we have to renew our minds. Watch what it says here. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect, which means that God's will is not supposed to be a mystery. It's supposed to be clearly understood as he has revealed it in the life of Jesus. Jesus is the full explanation of the will of God. Jesus came to do the will of God and God was with him to do it. So when you look at the life of Jesus, if Jesus did it, then you do it. If Jesus didn't do it, you stay far away from it. Far away. No, I didn't hear Jesus once say, I'm going through a, jo a Job trial. <laughs> Am I right? Did Jesus once say, no, this is just a Job thing I'm going through right now? Did he say that? Not one time. Not one time in the New Testament do you see even one of the disciples or the apostles say, I'm going through a Job thing right now. <laughs> Paul is literally being chased down and hunted. He's sleeping in graves. He is beating, like, he's having to fight his way for, away from thieves, all right? And he is, like, hunted down and he's being persecuted. And he still doesn't say, I'm going through a Job thing. You know why? Because Job wasn't their example, Jesus was. Uh -huh. You're not a disciple of Job, you're a disciple of Jesus. Now can we learn some things from Job? Sure. But he's not your example. Because it was written for you, but not to you. Is this making sense to you? Because the Job suffering is largely misunderstood and we will deal with it soon. Okay, so Ephesians 4. 11, it's the next page. So this is how we can adopt the mind of Christ, okay? Ephesians 4.11 says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to, so there's a reason why, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. To what? Equip the saints. Who are the saints? 
Only a bunch of dead people, right? No, No, you are the saints. Am I right? So, he says, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So these gifts are not meant to do the work of ministry. They're meant to equip you to do the work of ministry. Is it not right? Okay, watch what it says here. For building up the body of Christ until... So now how many of you are in the programming field or have any programming experience or anything like that? Nobody. (laughs) Only me. (laughs) Okay, have you got no programming experience? Okay, how many of you understand logic? Okay, right. So you will normally have a statement like, if A equals B, then C, else D, right? You understand that? Okay. Now there's a loop in programming. We, got, we, we can do a while loop, we can do a repeat, right? but we can also do an until loop. So we say, while x equals 75, do until x equals 105. Are you with me? So that means that when x changes to 105, the loop will stop. Am I right? So when they use the word until here, it means this first part has to happen until something else happens. That means that the first part goes away when this something else happens. Which means that those gifts are not meant to be there forever. It doesn't mean the function will go away. It just means the gifting of the function is no longer necessary because everyone's equipped with the function that comes from those gifts to equip the body for the function. Watch, I'll read it to you so you'll see what I'm saying. He says, To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we attain to the unity of the faith and the experiential knowledge of the Son of God. The word knowledge there isn't head knowledge, it's knowledge gained through reason of use. In other words, a person who is an arch, you know, when he, when he does archery and he has to shoot, you are a knowledgeable bowsman or a knowledgeable archer when you have actually shot a bow and arrow for a certain period of time and you've shown yourself effective. Then you are knowledgeable by reason of use. You don't just get knowledge and then know how to do it. How many of you can drive a car? Okay, so day one, when you got behind the steering wheel, how was that? Everyone's embarrassed to talk about it. Okay, why? Because when you got behind the steering wheel, that's when you actually gained the knowledge of how to drive. Before that, you were just learning about driving. Now you're actually driving. There's a difference between the knowledge you gained from reading something and the knowledge you get from doing something. Does that make sense? Okay, so he's saying, he's saying here, until we attain to the unity of the faith and the experiential knowledge of the Son of God. In other words, you are going to walk in your identity. You're going to start living out these things that are in Christ. Supernatural morality, supernatural power to heal, supernatural power to raise the dead, supernatural power to be mindful of the thoughts of others, supernatural power to have foreknowledge. Are you with me? All these things that were in Christ, those are how you experience the knowledge of the Son of God through reason of use. Does that make sense? Okay. What should he say here? And the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Isn't that what I just said? Okay. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Now, those who are experienced in ministry will know that there are doctrines that come in waves. Every so many years, the same doctrine comes around, and these are waves of doctrines. But when you understand the truth and you have experience in the Son of God, then those waves of doctrines no longer push you along because you know who you are. Does that make sense? Okay. These doctrines come by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So don't be surprised that people are twisting the scriptures today because they were doing it back then. They were writing this in Ephesians. 
And I will show you even where Paul Peter writes, and he says that people, the weak-minded, um, twists the scriptures that Paul wrote just as they twist the other scriptures. So there have been people twisting scriptures from the beginning of time, which is why we have to hold the line on sound doctrine. We can't continue to allow error to govern the body of Christ. We have to bring sound doctrine. And have you been feeling that this is more sound than a lot of maybe what you've learned in the past? Not that everything was bad, just in general. Am I right? Okay, watch. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up. So when you are born again, you are born complete. But when you grow up into what you're born into, then you become the full expression of that thing. Just like when you were born a baby, you, you as you are right now, you were in there. But you only got here by time as you grew up. Am I right? The spiritual is the same. That you may grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Because the goal of all our instruction is love that comes from a pure heart, a clean conscience, and a sincere faith. That's the finished, that's the finished work, is that when you're operating out of the nature of love, because God is love, and so are you, because you are in Him. Does it make sense? Okay, so hopefully from that what you understand is that these were given to help you renew your mind. Now when we talk about renewing your mind, we're not talking about um, adopting just another way of thinking only. We believe that if you have right thinking, it will lead to right action. So for example, I was explaining this yesterday. I said, if we go, if we decide we're going to go to KFC, but we end up going to Nando's, what happened? We changed our minds. How do we know? Because our direction changed. So a change of mind has to have a change of direction. Otherwise, you didn't really change your mind. You just thought it was a nice idea. So your direction has to change if you're changing your mind. Yes? Because your mind isn't just your brain. It's the will, the intellect, and the emotions agreeing. That's what it means to change your mind. The will, the intellect, and the emotions coming in agreement. Now, that's how you bring your soul into agreement with your spirit. And when your spirit and your soul agree, your body is overwhelmed by the two. Because when the two gang up on your body, then your body has to be submitted to the soul and the spirit. So the renewing of the mind is the key to adopting the mind of Christ so that your body is then under the jurisdiction of your spirit. Yes? Is yeah. it simple? All right. Hebrews 5 verse 12 to 13 says, For though by this time... So I'm going to show you the mechanism of how this operates so that you can see how it works. And I'm going to show you biblically the pattern that they used... Um, for the people there, right? So you can see how it can work for you here. Hebrews 5, 12 to 13 says, For by this time you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the basic principles and the oracles of God. Please underline basic principles and oracles of God. And you can put there the Old Testament scriptures. Okay, so how many of you have heard that um, we didn't have scripture until 300 years after Jesus' death? How many of you have heard that? Yes. So um, everything was by the Spirit up until there. You know? Everything was by the Spirit. They used the Torah and the prophets to teach from. So the basic principles and the oracles of God have always been Scripture. Are you with me? That's why we have it included in our Bibles. That's why we have the Torah and the prophets here in the beginning part. Does it make sense? And everything Paul and all those guys taught, how often did they not refer back to the Old Testament and bring it into the New? Over and over again. Am I correct? So we had Scripture all along. This idea that we didn't have Scripture is nonsense. We might not have had the, 
the actual book, the Bible, as we have it, because this is a library of books, but we've always had Scripture. So don't let people tell you, oh no, we were void of Scripture for hundreds of years, and the church was better off then, and blah, blah, blah. That's nonsense. Okay? It was never the case. We've always had Scripture because Scripture is God's Word to us. And the Bible says we have a more sure word, the prophetic word, that's in Scripture. Does it make sense? More sure than when, when they write this, I think it's Peter, when he writes this, he says, a more sure than actually being there, hearing the voice of God, was the Scripture. That's amazing, Right? So your spiritual experiences must never undermine the Word. Never. You know, we had a bunch of Mormons come to um, a family that we were ministering to, and they called me to come and sit down and, and talk to them. And I sat down and I spoke to them, and they wanted me to read their little fancy book given to them by their angel um, called the, the Book of Moron, Nick, Mom, or whatever it is. And so they said to me, now I must read this book and then I must ask the Holy Spirit to tell me whether it's true or not. Okay? So I said to him, I don't need to ask the Holy Spirit. All I need to do is compare it to this. Okay? And when your book disagrees with this, then your book is wrong. No, 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 no. Our book is the missing pieces. I'm like, no, no, no. What you're trying to do is elevate what you've written out of your imagination over Scripture, and that is error. And already there's error, and I don't want any part of it. See, that's how quickly you can cut that thing off. Because remember, those guys, they say, oh, we're the same, we're Christians. But they're not the same, because their God is a physical God, with a physical body, comes from some planet, okay? The devil is Jesus' brother. Yeah, he, listen, they're not the same. They want to pretend to be the same. But they're not the same. So don't fall for that trap. Mormons are not the same. In fact, Jehovah's Witnesses are closer than Mormons. And they're not the same either. Does it make sense? Because they want to rob Jesus of his deity. They want to make him to be just another son of God. Are you with me? But he is the son of God. Does it make sense? So don't fall into error. Like, keep the path straight. Stick to the word of God. And the more context you have, the better. That is the key. All right. Okay, so watch what he says here. He says, the basic principles and the oracles of God, you need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. Okay, so he just compared the basic principles and oracles of God to milk. Isn't that right? So he just said, Right? That the basic principles and the oracles of God are milk. And he said those who are unskilled need milk. In other words, those who have not developed their skills yet, those who have not put anything into practice yet, they need milk to remind them what they need to be doing. Does that make sense? Okay, watch. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1 to 3, Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, and he says, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. So notice, people who are operating out of the flesh are not not saved, they're infants. When a baby is born, it's all about me, 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 me. Change my diaper, feed my mouth. You know, burp me. Are you with me? It's me, me, me. Are you with me? So when a Christian is first born again, they still have carnality in the way they think. The discipleship has to happen for them to change the way they think and come in agreement with God's Word. Unfortunately, that, the, the job of that in some places has been done well, but in other places very poorly. And majority of it is very low level. Very low level. And mainly because as, at church, we often are teaching at the level of people early conversions or just coming in to the kingdom we're trying to get people born again so we're so the level of teaching is very low which is why we need to have more of these kind of seminars to bring the body of Christ and its level back up to where it's supposed to be so that it operates at the correct level does it make sense i don't blame pastors because they have to if you bring your friend to church, you want your friend to get saved, you're expecting the pastor to give a message that's going to help them get saved. 
So they're preaching at that level. They're not preaching to equip you. Are you with me? Unless you are part of extra classes and things like that. So that's where a ministry like what we do comes in handy because we can come in, we can equip the body, we can give you tools to start putting into practice and then we can come around every so many months and re-encourage you, add more people, re-encourage you and build that up to where you have an army of people who are charging the gates of hell and taking back the territory that the devil has stolen from us. Amen. Who's, who's good with that? At least my wife is good with that. All of you are just looking at me. I'm so happy she came along. I really need the encouragement. Okay. I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it, and even now you are not yet ready, for you are still in the flesh, while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving like mere humans? So you know how people say, well, I'm only human. You don't want to say that, man. Paul would have had a go at you. Because you are wall-to-wall -wall Holy Ghost inside here. So you're not only human. You're born again. You're a new creature. You're not only human. Don't identify with those humans. You are a God human. Are you with me? You are in God and He is in you. You are one with Him. Sure. So now it's time to stop acting like a human and start acting like the, the God human that you were created to be. Amen. All right. So watch. So this is, he's talking about the fact that when they are carnal, what is motivating them? Strife, envy, jealousy. Am I right? Okay. So, do we see that in church? Yes. Oh. So, which means you've got a bunch of babies. There's a, and you know what tires out a pastor more than anything else? It's a bunch of babies. Who's been a mom before? So show me quickly. How many babies can you handle at once? Three? Four? Five? Hmm? One. One. Are you sure? Only one. <laughs> She's been a mom. She knows. <laughs> now, a church of 50 people, and they're all babies. And you just put your head on the pillow, and then someone phones, My wife is fighting with me. <sighs> okay, okay. And then you're there. And then this one is saying that, and that one is saying that. And they don't, they're not even believing the Bible. They're not even submitting to the Bible. They're not letting the Holy Spirit change them. They don't want to hear. They just want one person to be right and the other person to be wrong. What are you doing here? You are both wrong. Amen. Jesus is right. Get on the program. <laughs> Do you understand? This is why we have so many problems. Because people are not growing up. They're staying babies. And we need to make sure that they grow up. Amen? Amen. I mean, how much more lovely would the world be if we all just grew up and acted like Jesus? It would be better, wouldn't it? Okay, so watch what he's saying here. He says, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for while you are not ready, even now you are not ready for it, for you are still of the flesh, for while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? The next verse is in 1 Peter 2, verse 1 to 3. It's a, let's turn the page. It says, So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. What does he say? Put, away. Put it away. He doesn't say grovel in the ground and cry for a week. He says, no, 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 no. Put it away. Open the cupboard. Put it away. Close the cupboard. Put a lock on the cupboard and don't go there again. Amen? Amen. Put it away. Right? Put away these things. All malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, and like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. So, so far, we've seen what milk is. Am I right? Milk is not... Um, some people will say that there's a difference between milk and meat, and meat is like deep diving into the scriptures and, you know, doing Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek and ninjutsu, and then you understand the meats, okay? 
The meat is on the street, people. The meat is in your office. The meat is in your family. Because the meat is the action of the milk. So if you keep receiving the milk, you become a very fat, ugly baby. You gotta take the milk and you gotta take the meat. How many of you mommies know if you don't feed your kids solid food, they're not gonna grow properly? You can't keep them on milk only. Am I right? So you've got to introduce meat at some point. So let me show you here in Hebrews 5.14. So we started with Hebrews 5.13. Now we're going to read 14. Okay? And, I've, and in between that, I've put a whole bunch of other stuff in. Am, am I correct? Okay? Watch, it says, But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. What is solid food? To do the word, right? And in James 1, to 25, James writes, says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror, and for he looks at himself and he goes away and at once he forgets what he was like. But the one who looks in the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres. Remember? Understanding. Endurance. Focus. Yeah? Perseverance. But being not a hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his sitting on his bum doing nothing. No, he'll be blessed in his doing. Am I right? So we can clearly see that doing is important. So did Jesus teach this thing? Let me show you. He did. John 4 verse 31. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Did he get some McDonald's secretly or something? <laughs> and Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Isn't that amazing? So we can see that the milk is the word that's meant to nourish and encourage us to take action. Do you know that a rhema word is a word that you take action on? It's a logos that you take action on. Did you know that? This idea that in a situation, unless you hear God specifically tell you that, it's no longer relevant, is untrue. The logos is always relevant. If you want more rhema, you need to know more logos. Because what happens is, in the situation, the logos comes to you in the moment, and it becomes rhema. Amen. Amen. Does it make sense to you? Oh, so we have this thing here about staying hot. Right? If you want to how many of you want to stay hot? Amen. Right. Okay, so H O T. Hear, obey, tell. Hear the word, do the word, share the word. Hear the word, do the word, share the word. If Christians, if every believer would do these three things, we would multiply the church exponentially. When, when anyone breaks down, if you break down at doing the word or if you break down at sharing the word, it's only hearing, 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 and the, shir- the church does this. But when, you, when people see that you're living what you're saying, then they're attracted to your life. But if they see you saying it and never doing it, then they think you don't really believe it. But if you hear it and you do it and you share it, and they see that what you're sharing, you're doing, then they're attracted to it. Because they want those principles. Because if it works in your life, it can also work in their life. So it's hear, obey, and tell. Doesn't the Bible say, whatever I whisper to you in the secret place, go and announce it on the rooftops? 
Is that what it says? So we can see that the mechanism of adopting the mind of Christ is by re receiving the word, right, and doing the word and being transformed by it. That's why you need to make your members a living sacrifice, which is pleasing and acceptable to God. Because unless you allow the word to change your thinking and let it change your action, then you're not a living sacrifice, you're a living thinkifice. It's my own made up word. Are you with me? So, you, so remember that you have been called unto this. Every single one of you here, you've been called to manifest God on the earth. Amen. That's why you're a son of God. You are the visible representation of the invisible God. Amen? Amen? So you're here for a purpose and a reason, and that purpose is very clear. From God's perspective, it's very clear. Let's take a 10-minute break, and we'll do the next session.